Well, good morning. Last Sunday night, we did a study on 2 Chronicles in chapter 20, and uh, it was a real blessing. So I thought today I would build upon that. Now, before we jump into 2 Chronicles 20, which is like 30 verses long, I appreciate uh, Russ reading that for us. Um, I want to give you a little background. You know that Saul was the first king of Israel. He sinned against God. There were times where he was demon-possessed. He spent years trying to kill David after God says, Saul, I'm going to remove, remove you from being king, and I'm going to have a man that's a man after my own heart to rule Israel. So David was anointed king, but Saul would not step down, and he chased David for years trying to kill him. Finally, David became king. David was that man after God's own heart, and even though he was not perfect, he was a man that loved the Lord, and it says one day Jesus Christ will rule and reign on David's throne. After David uh, passed away and died, his son Solomon became king. Col Solomon became a very wise, wise man, and he was very prosperous, and Israel experienced peace during his reign, but toward the end of his life, he had all these wild women he married, and concubines and everything else, and they stole away, he, his, the, his, their false god stole away his heart from the Lord. Many great men, many godly men, have fallen into sin because they didn't know how to react to the opposite sex. So if you're a godly man and you love the Lord, you'd be real careful. We all need to be very careful. After Solomon died, there was a, his son came along. His name was Rehoboam. Rehoboam was one of these young guys who thought he was a hot shot. And so when he came into power, he asked all of the, his dad's advisors, how should I rule Israel? And they said, well, your dad was kind of tough. Why don't you kind of back off a little bit? He asked his buddies from high school. He said, hey, what do y'all think? And they says, oh, your dad wasn't tough enough. You need to nail him. You need to rule with an iron fist. And he said, that sounds good to me. So he ruled really tough. And so and so the people, there were 12 tribes of Israel and all of them, but the tribe of Judah and Benjamin says, you're not going to rule over us. And they took off and they, they, the northern kingdom became Israel. That was their name. The southern kingdom, which was primarily the tribe of Judah and little Benjamin, it became the southern kingdom called Judah. And that's where Jerusalem was in Judah. So when I talk about Israel and I talk about Judah, I'm not talking about a foreign country. It's actually the same country, but there was re rebellion. So the northern kingdom got them a king named Jeroboam, and he was not related to Solomon's son, Rehoboam. They just had similar names. Jeroboam was a corrupt individual. And most all the kings of the northern kingdom Israel, they were corrupt and evil. The southern kingdom had a mixture. They had crummy kings, but they had some good kings. So later on, later on, uh, a king came by the name of Asa. He was a good king, loved the Lord, was ruled very, very, very well. But toward the end of his life, he fell into sin. And it kind of, he started out really well, but kind of ended poorly. Well, he had a son named Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a very good king. And God speaks very well of Jehoshaphat. He made some bad decisions at one point in his life. And so uh, God blessed him greatly with riches and honor. Uh, Jehoshaphat removed the high places. Now, what were the high places? The people worshipped. They'd fallen into paganism, and they were worshipping this false god called Baal. And they had these little altars up on top of the mountains. And so he came in as king, and he just wiped all those altars out. Later on, they put them back. Later on, he came back and wiped them out again. And toward the end of his life, after he'd wiped them out twice, at the end of his life, God said he failed to wipe out the, the high places. Well, he'd done it twice, but they went back a third time. I guess he's too tired to fool with it, and so he didn't wipe them out the third time. Jehoshaphat was a, was a really good king. He educated the entire kingdom of Judah. He said, if the people are going to really honor the Lord, they need to know what God's word, what God's law says. So he raised up people who were like priests and Levites to go around the whole kingdom and educate them in God's word so that they would really, truly love the Lord and follow the Lord. Most people did, but some didn't. Okay, at one point in his life, he made a big boo-boo. And I'm going to read that to you now, starting in 2 Chronicles chapter 17. And it says, Then Jehoshaphat his son, Asa's son, 
reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah. He set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father, his on down the line father, <clears throat> David. And he did not seek the Baals, the, the false gods, the pagan gods. But he sought the God of his father, and he walked in his commandments, not according to the acts of Israel, the northern kingdom. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat. They were so grateful for him. And, all, and, he, had, and he had riches and honor and abundance. And his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he, rem he removed the high places and the wooden images from Judah. Also in the third year of his reign, he sent his leaders to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them, he sent Levites and the priests. So they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. And they went throughout all the cities of Judah and they taught the people. Now over to chapter 18, verse 1. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance. And by marriage, he allied himself with Ahab. Oh my goodness. Here's where he messed up. Now, who was Ahab? Ahab was a pagan creep who ruled the northern kingdom, Israel. He was married to Nancy Pelosi. No, he was married to Jezebel. And they were evil and they were wicked, wicked people. But he allowed his son to marry Ahab's daughter, which was a bad mistake and it was sin against God. And so he... He, uh, he had riches and honor and abundance, and by marriage he al allied himself with Ahab, down to verse 3 of chapter 18. So Ahab, king of Judah, the bad guy, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? Now what is that? Ramoth Gilead was one of the cities that, uh, that they, Israel had, but Syria had come, had come in and conquered that area. So he's saying, will you come, Jehoshaphat, will you come and help me fight Assyria so we can regain Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, says, I am as you are and my people are as your people. We will go with you in war, said Jehoshaphat. Down to verse 5. The king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 men, and he says, Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? So this evil king, he's got 400 prophets. They're all his buddies, and he says, Okay, I want to know. Now, if I go to war against the Syrians, are we going to win or are we going to lose? And so <clears throat> they were all of one particular political party. <clears throat> and it says... Go up, they said, go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat, the godly king, said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There's still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Yeah, if you're a godly person and you live in a corrupt nation, they're going to hate you too. He says, but I hate him because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. Well, if you're evil, that's what you're going to get. <clears throat> he is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. So Jehoshaphat said, you don't need to talk bad about him. That's right. <laughs> Verse 14, then he came to the king. And the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead? And shall I refrain? Or shall I refrain? And Micaiah says, oh, go and, pro go and prosper and they'll, deliver, they'll be delivered into your hand. He's being sarcastic. He says, oh, yeah, man, go ahead. You know, because one guy's already said, you made a, he made some kind of hat with iron horns. And he said, you're going to destroy the Syrians just like somebody with iron horns on your head. So, so Micaiah says, oh yeah, man, go ahead. You're going you're gonna to whoop up on them. And he says, go and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. So the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you will tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then he says, Micaiah says, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep. 
that have no shepherd. And the Lord says, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I not tell you that he would, that he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? He said, I told you he was going to badmouth me. I told you. He hated him. So in verse 25, then the king of Israel says, Take Micaiah and you return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to jo Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison, and you feed him with bread of affliction and the water of affliction until I return in peace. But Micaiah says, If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he says, Take heed, all you people. So Micaiah says, Hey, hey, hey. Basically, he's saying, you're not going to return in peace. And all you people, I want you to be my witnesses. Down to verse 33. Now, a certain man of the enemy drew a bow at random with an arrow that says, to whom it may concern, and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, Ahab did, turn around and take me out of the battle. I'm wounded. The battle increased that day, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot facing the Syrians until evening, and about that time of sunset he died. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem, and Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went to meet him, and he said to King Jehoshaphat, who had disobeyed God in making an ally with, of Ahab, should, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, nevertheless, good things are found in you in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. Now, there are young people all across America who are Christians. And when times are tough, they will walk with the Lord. But when times get easy and it's just everyday life, they begin to get lax. And when you get lax, you start making wrong decisions. And there are a lot of people who are young men, young women, they'll say, oh, I'm going to get married. You are? Who are you married? Oh, I'm this, this sweet guy or this sweet girl. Oh, are they Christians? No, but they're nicer than most Christians I know. And they said that if, if and when we get married, they promise to go to church with me. Duh, that's the same thing that Jehoshaphat did when he got in league with Ahab. You do not compromise your relationship with the Lord. And Scripture says that we're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. If you start a business, don't get into business with an unsaved person. If you're going to get married, don't get married to an unsaved person. If you're going to get a date, don't date an unsaved person. Don't even date a carnal Christian. Don't date somebody who says, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I prayed a prayer when I was three years old and I go to church every Sunday. I don't care. Don't you date anybody unless they are a growing Christian who loves the Lord. And so what happens is we begin to make compromises with wickedness. Now in Washington, D.C., oh, we need to get along. We all get to, need to get together and get along together. You can't do that with evil. If you're, if you're a person that's conservative, or especially if you're a Christian, you can't compromise with evil. Stand your ground, and if you get killed for it, fine. But do not compromise with evil. Now, <coughs> excuse me. If living in this United States, political correctness, you hear about it all the time. Political correctness is right out of hell. Do not get caught up in trying to be politically correct. If you want to say he's an American Indian, say he's American Indian. You don't have to say a Native American. If you see a black person, you don't have to feel like you have to say they're an African American because most black people have never been to Africa. They are Americans. So when you get in public, you don't want to be obnoxious, but don't let political correctness tell you what to do. If you want to call somebody a garbage man, they're a garbage man. You don't have to say they're a sanitation engineer. You don't want to be rude and crude to people and make them feel bad, but you don't have to live under political correctness because political correctness is evil. So political correctness says if you want to live in a 
perverted lifestyle, it's okay as long as you love each other. No, it's not okay. If you are a young person, young woman, and you're trying to finish college and you get pregnant, oh, I don't know how I'm going to finish college if I'm pregnant. Well, it's okay, politically correct, to get an abortion. No, it's not. You're murdering your baby. Children are a gift from the Lord, whether they're illegitimate or not. So we're living in a politically correct society, which is really incorrect. You base your speech and activities and life on the Word of God, not what Washington, D.C. and the liberals expect you to say. Are you going to offend people? Yes, you will. Jesus Christ offended people. The Word of God offends people. They hate. You can talk about God. That's okay, because there are a lot of gods out there. There's only one true God. But they hate the name of Jesus Christ. You go to a secular college, a state college, and you start talking about Jesus Christ in class, they're going to tell you to shut your mouth. You can talk about Marxism. You can talk about all kinds of things that are politically correct, but you can't go into, for example, I went to the University of Alabama. You don't go into a class where you've got 150 students in there, and the, 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 the uh, professor's down there with a microphone down in the bottom of the hole, and he's talking and you bring up Jesus Christ, they're going to tell you this is not the place to talk about him. So don't get wrapped up in political correctness. I know I went nuts there, but hey, you know me, I'm nuts. I've been nuts for a long time. Okay, so Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house and he says... Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, we studied a few weeks ago, God's mercy endures forever to His people. Nevertheless, good things are found in you in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and you've prepared your heart to seek God. Now, that's no excuse to, to sin. Well, Lord, look at all these good things I've done. Y'all let me off the hook. God is merciful, but not when you take Him for granted. You don't take His forgiveness for granted. You don't presume upon His, his love for you. Verse 4, So Jehoshaphat dwelt in Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim, and he brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. He straightened the things out. Then he set judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city. And he said to those judges, You take heed to what you're doing, for you do not judge man, uh, but you do not judge for man, but for the Lord. Now, there's a problem we have with the Supreme Court in the United States. They judge for man, they don't judge for the Lord. They don't judge for righteousness, they, they judge according to political correctness, most of them. Most of the mess that we're in today with abortion and perversion and everything else that's legalized is because of the Supreme Court. Take heed to what you're doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you in judgment. Now, therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you and take care and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God and no partiality nor taking of bribes. Now we get down to chapter 20. We're going to look at four things we looked at last Sunday night. We're going to look in verses 1 through 2. We're going to see the plight or the problem. Verses 3 through 13, we're going to see the prayer. Verses 14 through 18, we're going to see the power. And verses 19 through 30, we're going to see the praise. Now, God will allow you to go through difficult times. God will allow you to go through impossible times. And the title of this message is, When You Feel Helpless. When you feel helpless, what do you do? When you're in a position of some circumstance and you don't like it and you're afraid, you're desperate, but you feel helpless and there's nothing you can do to change it, what do you do? If you're not in a helpless situation right now, you will be. Now, I personally, I've done a lot of counseling the past week or so, past two weeks. People here, people in other states, and these people that I have met with are facing impossible situations. They're impossible situations. Pastor, what do I do? What do you do? And so when you go through an impossible situation, God is still in control. You may die and go to heaven, but He will deliver you through taking you home. 
But God many times will allow impossible situations, and I, we talked about this, I met, mentioned this in Sunday school. I'm, I don't teach Sunday school, okay? Rob teaches Sunday school, he does a good job. Sometimes Russ teaches Sunday school and Rob's not here. I just go and listen and have a good time. <clears throat> Sometimes God will allow you to get into a situation that's impossible and he will use you. Think about this now. When the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, they got as far as the Red Sea. Huh? God, you're, le you're leading us to the shore of the Red Sea and the water's already hitting me in the feet. Sometimes God will set you up as bait. Bait? Yeah, bait. Who likes to be bait? You don't. But if you're bait for the Lord, nothing can touch you. If you're God's bait, he's luring in the enemy to make the enemy look like fools. And so God gave Pharaoh test after test after test, and Pharaoh rebelled against every one of them. And finally, the firstborn of Egypt, including Pharaoh's son, died. And Pharaoh said, okay, get out of here. And he turned all these people loose, probably about two million Jews. They headed out, got to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh says, what am I doing? They took all of our, they, we, had to gave them, we gave them all of our valuables. I don't have all this free slave labor, labor anymore. What do we, let's just go get them. And, and, and if we can't go get them, just go kill them all. So he gets all of his chariots and all of his, all of his army, and they head out to get them. And the children of Israel, they would never read the book of Exodus. And they, they get to the Red Sea, and they're terrified. God, what are, you go, what are we going to do? Look. We are in an impossible situation. I don't like impossible situations. You led us out of Egypt. We had plenty of leeks and garlic, and at least and now we're going to die. And we don't have scuba gear. We don't have kayaks, and we're, we're stuck. <coughs> oh, <clears throat> I'm coughing because this week I had in my diet thing, I had some little mashed potatoes and they said microwave them and I got ready to eat them, I ate them too early. I burnt the back of my throat. It's like I swallowed a charcoal briquette. I felt like, uh, what is it, the magic dragon? Puff the magic dragon. Okay. What's steam coming out of my mouth? <clears throat> so anyway, God will use you as bait. And you don't like being bait, but God's saying, wait, wait, wait. I'm just going to put you here so that I can lure in the wicked and I can deal with them. And so he did that. And so here comes Pharaoh and his armies, you know, and, and all of a sudden the waters part and the children of Israel go through the Red Sea, not the Reed Sea. That's only about two feet deep. You don't drown an army in two feet of water. Liberal theologian says, no, it was the Red Sea, not the Red Sea. No, it was the Red Sea. And they went through on dry ground with a wall of water on this side and a wall of water on this side. And you know how the story goes. And then once they got to the other side, Pharaoh and his army says, let's go get them. They got out there and all of a sudden God brought, God brought the waters back together and drowned them all. And he says, hey, you Egyptians took the bait. Hey, and you my bait? You see how faithful I am in protecting you and taking care of you? So God will show his faithfulness to you and will God show his power against evil. So when you're in an impossible situation, it's still not impossible to God. Now, Jehoshaphat and his, his nation now are in an impossible situation because now they're, come, they're about to come under attack from three different large armies. And so it says, it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea. Now this is talking about the Dead Sea. From Syria, which is really a better translation, which is Edom. You say, why do you say that? Because if you go down to verse 10, it says... <clears throat> And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which is in Seir, I mean, which is in Edom. Now, <clears throat> earlier, when they came out of Egypt, God says, destroy the enemy, but don't do not go and fight Moab of the Ammonites or the Edomites. Why? Because the Moabites and the Ammonites, they were descendant from 
uh, Abraham's nephew, Lot. They're part of the family. And then don't, des don't destroy the Edomites. Why? Because they're descendants of Jacob's brother Esau. They're part of the family. So God says, don't go and kill them because they're still descended. They're, they're your relatives. Okay? So then when the children of Israel come out of Egypt, the, the, those three countries treat them like dirt. And so it says, <clears throat> And Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord. Now, when you become fearful, the tendency is to take matters into your own hands. And God told his people, and Jesus told his disciples over and over and over, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. And so when they go real quickly to 1 Peter chapter 3, God talks to wives who are married to men who are disobedient to God. And so in that, God says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some of them do not obey the word, they, without a word, without sermons, may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct coupled with fear, now that word fear means respect, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging your hair, wearing of gold, putting on fine apparel. He didn't say don't wear them you wouldn't be wearing clothes. But he says, don't let that be the thing that keeps your husband's attention. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. So a gentle and quiet spirit is precious to God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with terror. And when a woman becomes afraid with terror, she has a tendency, and men will too, we have a tendency to take it back out of God's hands and, hey, look, this is really serious. I need to do something. And we decide I need to do something. I need to make it work because I'm terrified. God says, don't. When you're terrified, trust me. Don't let fear rule you. Let Christ rule you. He's in control. He created the universe. He can take care of you. And Paul said, for me to live is Christ and die is gain. So if you die, you're going to be better off. And you're not going to really die. You're just going to step out of your body into the presence of Jesus Christ and the family of God. We will live for eternity. So let me chug on down through here. So in verses 3 through 13, we have the prayer. And Jehoshaphat feared, Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord and to proclaim a fast throughout all of Judah. He responded correctly. He sought the Lord, and he, he declared a fast. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. That's what we need to do in the United States. If we had people up in Washington, D.C., all of a sudden say, we're going to trust God about this COVID-19. We're going to take it to the Lord. I'd fall over dead. <laughs> I wouldn't have to worry about COVID killing me. I'd be dying from shock. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord from all the cities of Judah. They came to seek the Lord. They came from all the 50 states of the United States to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he says, O oh Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? So he starts out and he starts talking about the power of God. When you're going through an impossible situation, don't focus on the circumstance. Focus on God's power. Are you not the God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God? And so he's, he's reviewing the power of God. The next thing he does is he talks about the faithfulness of God. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in, your, uh, in it for your name, saying, and then there's this commitment that's made by the people. If disaster comes upon us, United States, you Christians in America, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, famine, jail, whatever it is, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and we are the temple of the living God now. And we cry out to you in our affliction, you will hear and save. And now, hear the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. 
whom you would not let Israel invade when we came out of the land of Egypt. Why? Because they're part of the family. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given to us as our inheritance. Look how they're rewarding us for not wiping them out. <clears throat> oh, our God, will you not judge them? For they have no power against, we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Lord, we don't know what to do, but we're going to trust you. I don't know how it's going to work out, but we're going to trust you. I don't know how you're going to save us, but we're going to trust you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we will not bow down. Our God will deliver us, but if he doesn't deliver us, we will still not bow down to your statue. Now all Judah, with their little ones, they didn't even send them off to children's church. You're against children's church. In some ways I am. I think children need to be sitting with their parents on Sunday morning, and I'm thankful for our children, young folks, young men, women in this church, that when you, you, you call upon them, they're quick to serve. We have young folks in our church, you know, who are serving the Lord just like an adult. You don't see that very often. They stick them back in a room somewhere. Our children are a vital part of our church family. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Then we see in verses 14 through 19, the power of God. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah. By the way, my little grandson, Finn, his name is Finn Benaiah James Vale. He was named after Benaiah here. Or the Benaiah who was one of God's, uh, David's mighty men. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all of you Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. Now here's God's message after they've been praying, okay? God sends a message. Now if you're facing an impossible situation, but God sent you a letter in the mail... You've heard me say this before. You open it up and God says, you're going to go through an impossible situation soon, but don't worry. All things work together for good if you love me and you're called according to my purpose. Now we've heard a few weeks ago, I preached on the greatest, the great lo the greatest love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. God said, when you love me, you trust me, all things will work together for good for you or for others. It's going to work out for good. Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. You, the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman accomplishes much. You can pray and cause God's hand to move, but God is powerful. Tomorrow, go down against them, and they will surely come up to the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. You, you won't need to fight these three armies. Really? No, you, don't, you won't even have to fight them. Position yourselves, then he says, stand still. Oh my good, Lord, how can we stand still? We got three armies coming after us. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God just says, just stand here, watch me. Just watch me. When you're trusting in the Lord, you look at his past, you look at his power, you look at his past faithfulness, and you can stand back and watch him work as you pray and trust him. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Oh, that gives you comfort. When you've got people running this country, God's with you. O oh, Jude and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord and worshiping the Lord. Well, that's a great thing for a nation to do. Number four. And we have the praise. We saw the power, and now we see the praise. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Ko Kohathites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with vo voices loud and high. That's what I, you know, in our church, I want us to make sure that when we sing hymns, we don't just sing, 
Amazing grace, how sweet. Now, nah, man, let's sing it out. Sing it out loud. Let's sing and worship the Lord. Sing loud. Let's knock the roof off the church. Praising Him. That's why we don't know to sing songs just because it's fun to sing or because it sounds good or we just know the songs we've sang them a thousand times. Sing the song like you've never heard it before and sing it loud to the Lord because you love Him. I got in myself in trouble the other day on Facebook, I said, Christians say it's a sin to lie, but we sin every Sunday when we sing in church. We're singing words we don't mean. Oh, people got upset. You're so self-righteous. You're so judgmental. I, hey, I'm just telling the truth, man. I know how it is. People sing songs. They don't even think about the words. They just sing them. Oh, but I like this song. It's got a beautiful melody. No! Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, and who should praise the beauty of his holiness. And as they went out before the army, they were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercies endure forever. Now they're going out against the armies, but they weren't going to fight. They were going to go get the watch. It's like God said, I've given you ringside tickets to watch me beat these guys up. So they're singing, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, or began to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of the Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, the Edomites, to utterly kill and destroy them. For some reason, the Ammonites and the Moabites decided they're going to kill the Edomites. So they killed them all. But then they got freaked out, and when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to kill each other. They all killed each other. Well, I don't know, God just made them get goofy or something. They all killed each other. So when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. Not one escaped. And I'm sure God's going, I told you. <laughs> There's a little video out, uh, I think it was called Risen. Uh, called Risen. And so this centurion, he says, why do you guys follow Jesus Christ? And before they could answer, this leper came up. And everybody's going, get out of here, get out of here, all the people. Get out of here. And Jesus went up to the leper. He just put his arms around him and hugged him, loved on him. And, and then he, he walked away, and the leper started walking away. And as he turned around, he looked, and all this leprosy was gone. And one of the disciples looked at the centurion and says, that's why we follow him. <laughs> I loved it. I don't know. So when Judah came to the place, oh, listen. Uh, when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were dead bodies falling on the earth, and no one escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, all the valuables, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. They were three days gathering the spoil, all the valuables, because there was so much. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Barakah, and there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the place is the Valley of Barakah until this day. Then they returned every man of Judah uh, in Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet for his God gave him rest all around. Praise the Lord. There's real rest in Jesus Christ. Now, in your life, you may not have three armies coming against you, but you may have some big sin that is overpowering your life and nobody knows about it. You talk about the Lord, you say you love the Lord, and maybe you do love the Lord, but at the same time, you know there's a pet sin and you can't get away from it. Give it to the Lord. Get into the Word of God. Review the power of God. Review the faithfulness of God. And make a commitment that, God, I will seek your face to love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. And God said he will provide a way for you to escape, that you will be able to bear it. God will now allow you to be tempted greater than you can stand. 
If you keep sinning, it's because you want to. God, please get me into the Word of God more often so you can change my want to. And God will give you victory. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He's not talking about being a millionaire by the time you're 30. He's talking about being victorious over sin. Now you say, I don't know how to delight myself in the Lord. You do like I did with coffee. I thought coffee was the nastiest tasting stuff in the world. It tastes terrible. And then Hope drinks, it. Hope drinks that old iced coffee. I'd rather take cow patties and soak it in water. It's nasty. I said, Hope, how do you drink that stuff? And she puts artificial sweetener in it. It tastes terrible. Now, I'll drink regular coffee that's hot, but I can't drink it black. I have to have about five pounds of sugar in it. like coffee now as long as I can doctor it up. So I've acquired a taste for it. So the more you get into the Word of God, you're going to acquire a taste for it. And like cocaine, you will become addicted to it. Now, if you're going through an impossible situation, think about what we said. Go back and read 2 Chronicles chapter 20, 1-30. through 30. Read it every day and say, Lord, here's my impossible situation and give it to Him. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. We thank you for how faithful you are. We rejoice in the fact that no matter what happens in the world, no matter what happens in the United States of America, you are in control. We are your children. You have us in the palm of your hand. You says nothing can, can separate us from your love. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Lord, we're thankful that you've already told us that all things will work together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So sometimes, Lord, we forget about the loving you part. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you loved us so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to shed his blood for our sins, taking the punishment that we deserve upon himself. And Lord Jesus, rising again three days later, victorious. Thank you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.